Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with 10 essential overtures for beginners. Oh, this is so much fun. You know how many overtures there are. Let me tell you how many overtures there are. Think of it this way. There are basically two kinds of overture. Overture means opening. It means something you play first. It's the beginning of something. It's the introduction to something. Or it can simply be a standalone work that can open a concert or just you play it just to listen to it. Sometimes it closes a concert. It doesn't matter. It's called an overture. But if you think about it, if you think about it, every single theatrical work, opera, ballet, dance thing, you know, play, because in those days, theaters had full orchestras as often as not, and plays were accompanied by film music called incidental music, except it wasn't a film, it was a play. Everyone wrote overtures for everything. So you take all of those overtures, and then you add to that the list of freestanding or independent overtures, what are sometimes called concert overtures, many of which are indistinguishable from what later became known as symphonic poems. For example, Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet is unquestionably a symphonic poem. It tells a story in quite graphic terms, but he called it an overture. So, you know, the, the terminology is blurry, as is typically the fact with classical music. And so you've got just billions of these things, <clears throat> unbelievably large quantities, insane large quantities. So I picked 10. And this 10 is, it's just 10. I mean, you know, you can, you can make your own list. I'll bet you who know probably, you know, those of you who know absolutely nothing about classical music could come up with your own list of 10 that's different from my list of 10 if you wanted to, given about 30 seconds on Google. You know, I mean, it really is. It, it, there's lots of them. And they're wonderful. And they're mostly short for the most part. And just... Short meaning less than a symphony. You know, they could be, you know, 15, 20 minutes long, but, you know, uh, there's, there's standalone single pieces. Let's put it that way. Some are longer than others. And wow, is there some great music in these overtures. And like, like the other talks I do on shorter works, they make wonderful stepping stones to the bigger things because longer works in classical music are simply collections of shorter ones. You know, you take three or four of these suckers, jam them together, and poof! You get a symphony or something like that. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of like that. You know, the forms accrete. And so you can just start with your overtures. And my God, this is, a, oh, this is a, such a fun list. I, I, loved, I loved listening to this list while I was putting it together. Let's start with Mozart, shall we? The Overture to the Magic Flute, Mozart's last major opera. There was actually another one that was around the same time called La Clemenza de Tito, um, and Mozart wrote an overture for that in like 15 minutes before the premiere, so it's not as good as the overture to the Magic Flute. The Magic Flute is an opera that I absolutely loathe. I can't stand it. I really, really can't stand it at all. Not because the music isn't beautiful. It is. It's late Mozart. It's sublime, like all late Mozart. But it, this plot is just stupid, and it just irritates the... Well, bothers me to death. And it has lots of dialogue. It's an opera with dialogue. It's more like a musical. And what they're talking about, you just don't want to know half the time. I mean, everything events racist. It's misogynist. The plot is stupid. And it has the most phenomenal music. Oh, my God. So why do we listen to it? We listen to it for the music, clearly. And this wonderful, wonderful overture that really does foretell the numerical symbolism of the opera to come, because, you know, the, the whole opera is a, a symbolic sort of uh, um, exposition of Freemasonry. And so they were into the number three. So you have, you know, three, three ladies and three things and three stuff and three this and three of things. And so in the middle of the overture, you get the three magic chords, Bumpa, bumpa, bumpa. Yes. Now that you've known that, don't you think that you're really that much further ahead? You can ignore the three thing and the Freemasonry stuff. What matters is the overture, which is just brilliant. Everything else is so much more important than that. But if you ever see anyone talk about the magic flute, they're going to talk about Freemasons. So you might as well hear it from me first, because then you can say, oh, but isn't the 
the con counterpoint in the opening of the Allegro of the Overture so much more vivid and, and fabulous and lively. And it is. Go listen to it and you'll see for yourself. Next, Beethoven, the Coriolan Overture. Now, the Coriolan Overture, the story of Coriolan, there were two of them. You know, there's Shakespeare's and then there's uh, German guys. And Beethoven's um, overture is based on the German guy's story, not Shakespeare's. And there's a whole, whole tumult in the literature about which story Beethoven was, because everyone says, well, the German guy's play was kind of lousy, but Beethoven's overture is so fabulous that it must be Shakespearean. I mean, that's the kind of logic that like happens in mus musicological circles. It's just beyond silly. Beethoven wrote it for the guy he wrote it for. And actually, this is a freestanding concert overture, which is every bit a, a symphonic poem. It tells the story that um, of Coriolanus, who is, you know, a Roman general who is, you know, exiled unfairly. And so he wants to get revenge. And so he joins the other side. And just as they're about to conquer Rome, his was his wife or girlfriend and mother, and they beg him to take pity on, on the Romans. And, and so he changes his mind and his erstwhile ally, allies kill him or he commits suicide or something. It depends which play you're looking at, actually. Um, but it's very, very clear what the elements of the Coriolan Overture are. There's the anger of Coriolanus himself and his twitchy, neurotic, you know, he's, he's, a, he's, he's a caged animal. And his music really reflects that. Then you've got the more lyrical music of the feminine element trying to persuade him to calm down and have mercy. And it's like, da, 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 da. It's, it's obviously, you know, that lyrical, beautiful element. And, and then the whole thing just goes to pieces and he, he uh, kills himself. It's the suicide at the end, you can tell, because his theme, it's his music, it all just disintegrates and, and ends in total darkness and, and death. Gosh, it's wonderful. And it all happens in between like six to eight minutes, depending on the performance. Can't go wrong with this one, folks. Cannot. So after that, Weber. We're back to a normal opera now. The Overture to Der Freischutz. Oh, by the way, and Beethoven's was used for performances of the play, but that's not how it was written originally. It got used later, just so we clear that up. Because someone may tell you, you know, again, you know, they may say, oh, well, you know, it was used for a play. I say, yeah, well, Beethoven wrote it separately. Anyway, Der Freischutz. Well, that translates, you know, Schutz is shooter, you know, someone who shoots things, and Fry means free. Um, it, it really is sort of, sort of the, the, you know, it's a shooting contest. You know, the marksman is really probably the best translation to Der Freischutz. And Der Freischutz is the, the, quintessential German romantic opera. This was written when Beethoven still had like 10 years to live. But if you listen to this overture compared to Coriolan, it sounds like a totally different world of music. Weber was an extraordinary master of the orchestra. And his, his use, for example, of four horns in harmony at the beginning of the overture, it's just the essence of, of romantic music. You know, the idea of it all takes place. It's like the woods and there's a demon and, you know, who wants to get the shooter guy to, 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 to kill his girlfriend because she spurned the other, the other shooter guy. And it's, it's a love triangle with, with Satan sort of stuck into the middle. Um, that's basically the story. And of course it doesn't work and she's fine. And, and you know, and, and she has her own tune. Do, 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 do. Yeah, but the rest of it is wonderful. And if you used to watch The Lone Ranger on television, the old 1950s television series, they used the storm, the the forging scene, the magic bullet forging scene music, which is in the overture. Bum ba ta da 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 ba da 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 da. I can't sing it. It's 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 all you know turmoil and noise. But th that is that is the uh, was the background music. In a lot of the Lone Ranger, they used classical pieces for, you know, their atmospheric mood music because it was public domain and cheap. And they had stock, you know, sound clips they could use for television shows of those days. And Der Freischutz was one of the biggies. It's a wonderfully fun piece to listen to. And it was so popular when the uh, opera first um, premiered that they encored the overture. You never even got to the opera. <clears throat> Everyone just got hung up on the overture. And so will you. Next. Mendelssohn, the Hebrides, 
or Fingal's Cave. It's called both. Now, the Hebrides, you know this one, because this was also used in cartoons, like Bugs Bunny cartoons and things like that. It's in all of those 1950s and 40s, you know, you know the tune. Da 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 bum. Ya da 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 bum. Ya da 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 bum. Ya da 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 bum. Right? That, that's, that's the tune. It's so catchy. It apparently came to Mendelssohn while he was there on his tour of, of Scotland and the British Isles and, and the wild and woolly. It's a seascape, it's a water piece. It's, it's all about waves, you know, gushing up against the cliffs at Fingal's Cave, which you can actually go and see if you want. I mean, Fingal is gone, but the cave is still there. And, and it's, oh, it's just a wonderful work, a brilliant, fabulous work. And, you know, instantly identifiable. It's part of our sort of cultural DNA now, just because of that little tune. Ya da 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 boom. Da, 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 da. Well, that's the second bit of it. It's the opening's minor key, but you know, do, 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 do. Well, anyway, never mind. You'll it, it, now it's stuck in my head. It'll be stuck in yours. I guarantee. It's fabulous. So it's and it's like ten minutes long, nine minutes long. But just think of water, ocean, surging, surging waves, and oh my God, it's beautiful. Okay, next. Oh, we had to do this one. Rossini, the overture to the Wabbit of Seville. I mean, the Barber of Seville. You know, I've, I've been watching a lot of classic cartoons lately and with my partner, who's a, an animation, you know, maven. And it, it, it is wonderful how, mu how many of us learned what the classics were from watching like Bugs Bunny and Tom and Jerry. These things, I mean, they, they, Tom and Jerry did Carmen, you know, they did operas, they did, you know, List Second Hungarian Rhapsody. They, they did all of that, you know, Leopold Stokowski shows up with these things. It was so wonderful, you know, how there was sort of a, a cultural consciousness about even popular, popular works of art in those days, um, which has since sort of disappeared. I mean, now we, the days we hear this stuff in commercials and in movies to a certain degree, but not to, not, not to the same extent. I mean, and boy, oh boy, the Barber of Seville. Oh, the only thing that's funny about the Barber of Seville is that it was not actually um, originally written for the Barber of Seville. Rossini wrote his overtures, most of them, not all of them, but most of them as separate works that he could attach to whatever opera he was doing at the time when he needed something to get the audience to shut up and let them know that the play was, you know, the show was about to begin. And the Barber of Seville was one of those. We call it the Overture to the Barber of Seville because that's the opera that, that we know it from. But if we knew earlier Rossini's operas, two of them, in fact, he did Aureliano in Palmyra and then Elisabetta, Regina de Inglaterra, Elizabeth I, Queen of England, tragedy, you know, about Elizabeth and Essex and all that, that whole story, you know, that had this overture. And that's kind of like scary when you think about it, because, it, you know, that's a tragic opera. This is certainly not a tragic overture. But that wasn't the point in Rossini's Italy in those days. Whether it was tragic or comic was irrelevant. The point was to make some noise, to let people know that they should sit down and stop eating their, their, their food and gambling. You know, they used to gamble. The, the, the opera houses also had casinos in the lobbies. And when Rossini was the director of the opera house in Naples, he didn't make money producing operas. He made money at the casino. That was the money-making operation at the front of the opera house. And you know, they really should bring that custom back. Because if they brought gambling back to cultural institutions, then not only would you have many, many more people going to see the Symphony of the Opera, but they wouldn't need public subsidy at all. That would be a fabulous idea, I think. I mean, they really knew how to do things back in those days. And so, so that was the deal. But you know the Barber of Seville. I don't need to tell you. You know, da 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 you know, seascapes are very popular subjects for overtures. You know, we have, we had the Hebrides or Fingal's Cave, and now we have Le Corsair. This is just, oh, what a great tune this one has. My God. Da, 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 da,
it's a really exciting overture. The opening is is is, is just wind in the sails and 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 seagulls flapping and it's very virtuosic for the violins and for the whole orchestra and just brilliant writing for the brass. It's it's so Berliozzi. Berlioz is one of those composers who has such an immediately identifiable sound. It's it's very bright. You know, his mean sonority, that is, you know, where he positions the orchestral accompaniments and how he plays his tunes is is high. So it sounds like there's there it's always like levitating. Even when even when he's writing like bass lines and low music, there's this sense of lift to everything that he does, and you really hear it in this particular overture. Berlioz's overtures all sort of start the same way. They begin with this giant rush of melody, and then there's a pause, and you hear this beautiful lyrical tune, and then as the beautiful lyrical tune winds up, you come back to the opening, and then this sort of allegro quick business gets moving, and once this thing gets rocking, it really rocks. It's just terrific. So that's the Corsair. And then we have, oh yeah, another sea one. Oh, I love these ocean ones. I picked a few of them, the, the water ones, because I think that it's wonderful to hear how different composers realize similar stories. Wagner's The Flying Dutchman. Bum, ba, da, 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 da. Well, The Flying Dutchman is about a Dutchman who flies. No, actually, that's the name of the boat. It's about a a captain who is cursed to sail forever until he is redeemed by the love of a woman. In this case, Senta, um, who redeems him by flinging herself off a cliff into the ocean to join him forever in eternal redemptitude or something like that. But the Flying Dutchman begins with a portrait of a, a, a ship at sea in a storm. It's stormy. It's yum. But da but da the strings are going like that. It's just fantastic. And as the great English music critic Donald Francis Tovey pointed out, he said, the overture is immeasurably riper than anything in the actual opera. And he was right. It's a wonderful overture. It's long had an independent existence in the concert hall whereas the opera is a little bit controversial because it exists in an original version, in one act, which is the one we should really focus on, and then as a three-act thing and with a more obviously redemptive finale at the end, um, you know, with harps and, you know, redempting music, redeeming everybody. But uh, it, it's not a bad opera. It's early Wagner. Um, and it's it, the first version of it, I think, is, is the one to hear. It has more urgency, if you care, if you want to go listen to the opera. But in the meantime, you have this overture, which so neatly encapsulates everything that's going on in the opera that you, you're kind of like, well, you know, uh, you're just as far ahead before the opera even begins. So you can listen to the overture with an, with, with an open heart and confidence that you're you've basically gotten all you need to get out of it um but that's that's me you know you always have to remember this is not about me this is about you this is about what you want and what you like and what you can put up with so you may be able to put up with the rest of the flying dutchman better than i can you know my problem with the flying dutchman has nothing to do with the music it has to do with the fact that i was sitting in the front row of the met during a production of it with my my delightful cousin Thelma, who's a lovely, lovely person who lived in the city, and she used to let me stay with her, and we would go see cultural events. And she was taking off her vest as the overture began, and she dislocated her shoulder. And so it went, bum ba da 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 And everyone else around us went, shh, shh. And I turned around to her, and she said to me, I need to go to the hospital. And I said, what do you mean you need to go to the hospital? And she said, I need to go to the hospital. And I said, well, it just started. You know, she said, I dislocated my shoulder. I can't move. I need to go to the hospital. I said, well, you know, what am I supposed to do about that? We were at the front of the grand tier with people spread out on both sides of us. She said, get me a doctor. Get me a doctor now. So, of course, I got up and I went, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me. And I got to the usher. I called the usher. The usher called the doctor. You know, the Met 
the Metropolitan Opera House, it has a whole hospital back, backstage, you know, I mean, for, for audience members, because, you know, the average, the average age of an audience person at the opera is like 170. So they drop dead all the time, where they have seizures or conniptions of various kinds. So they can do just about anything. So the doctor, I said, I, my, my cousin, she has a bum, a bum shoulder, she just dislocated it, we need help, we need help now. And the doctor, who is sitting there in this state-of-the-art facility, I mean, he could have done a liver transplant if he needed to, he gives me some Tylenol and a glass of water and says, okay, give this to her and tell her to come back at intermission or something like that, you know. Well, there was no intermission. They were doing the original version, I think. So I come back with the Tylenol and he says, here, just take, the doctor said, just take these Tylenol. We'll be fine. And she said, get me out of here. I can't move. I need to go to a hospital. So um, I said, okay. I, I got up again, you know, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me. And I went back to the doctor. I said, she's got to go to a hospital. Well, they have ambulances on call for the audience at the Met. Yes, they do. And they get plenty of use, it turns out. So so uh, they got the ambulance and I went back, you know, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me. I said, okay, let's let's go. We're going to the ambulance. She says, well, I can't move. The pain is, it's excruciating. And it, it is. I mean, it really was. She was in agony. And I said, we have to get up. Come on. And fortunately, my cousin Thelma is like four feet tall. You know, she's a tiny little, tiny little lady. And we, we got her up. And, and now we're, now it was, excuse me, ah, excuse me, ah, excuse me, ah, excuse me, ah. She's like screaming her way to the top of the grand tier. And we get in the hospital. And I mean, we get in the ambulance and we go to the hospital. And so I spent my Flying Dutchman front row grand tier tickets in the emergency room in a New York hospital, um, you know, near Lincoln, the one nearest Lincoln Center, which is not really there anymore, and it's obvious why, um, on a Saturday night in New York City in 1970s. And that was actually more entertaining than the opera ever could have been, because what they do is, when you went into that emergency room, they had a, they had a guard, an armed guard, who would open the locked door, stuff you in the emergency room, and then close the door, lock it behind you, and stare in through the window to watch the mayhem within. So I got my cousin Thelma into the emergency room and, you know, she went to see a doctor and I hear all the screaming and shrieking in there as they're trying to manipulate her shoulder back in. And I got her husband to come in. And while I sat there, there was, there was one stabbing. Um, there was at least two fist fights. And, and the biggest, the biggest problem was the people who wanted methadone, but they didn't do detox on the weekends. For some reason, you can't be a drug addict in those days in 1974. You could not be a drug addict in New York um, on the weekends. And so and so um, this woman wanted her methadone and the triage nurse was saying, we well, don't have any and you can't have it and you have to wait until Monday. And she said, I can't wait till Monday. I need it now. And the nurse said, you have to wait. And, and, and so the woman pulls a stiletto out of her boot and says, I want my methadone. And the triage nurse just hauls off and pow, knocks her flat. And then in the chair next to me was a, 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 another, another woman who was demonstrating how to give a urine sample. And, and that was the Flying Dutchman. I think that's enough, really, don't you? <laughs> so go listen to the overture. It really go listen to the overture. It was I never even got through the overture. I didn't even get past the opening of the overture. And so that was my Flying Dutchman experience. Uh, next, okay, let's let's move on and, and wipe, you know, wrap this up. Tchaikovsky, the 1812 Overture. Now, the 1812 Overture is an overture that is an overture to nothing because it's it's a standalone work, and it's kind of hard to imagine what you would play after it since it is the first piece of music ever written that includes a part for an entire city. I mean, think about it for a moment, because at the end, you know, you've got cannons going off. I mean, so you've got, okay, yeah, you've got the military. There are other pieces that required the military to contribute. Beethoven's Wellington's Victory, for example, and even earlier Baroque pieces that, you know, imitate all of that stuff. But with Tchaikovsky, you have to have the bells of all of the churches and the entire city going off appropriately at the right time. And not an easy thing to synchronize by the way. And in most performances, they, of course, they use, they get the biggest bells they have, or they pre-record them, or they do it in the church where you have a carol on that you can use, or they, you know, they, you have lots of people whacking chimes all over the place. But what Tchaikovsky really wanted was Moscow, 
all of it as part of the 1812 overture. Oh my goodness, it's so much fun. You know, when Tchaikovsky wrote it, they asked him about it. And, you know, he said, you know, they asked him what he thought about it. And he said, it's very noisy. And so it is. He, of course, thought it was a piece of trash. He had no idea that it would become one of the most beloved pieces of music of the entire repertoire. Because even when Tchaikovsky writes a piece of trash with brass bands and cannons in an entire city, participating, it's fabulous because he wrote tunes. I mean, there's, there's the Marseillaise, there's that tune, and then there's the God Save the Emperor tune, you know. Da, 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 there's that one. And then there's Russian chant. Da, 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 bum, 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 ba, 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 boom, crash. It's, you know, and there are versions that have a chorus, which don't listen to the one with the chorus. It's horrible. And uh, Carrion did it with the Don Cossack Choir. Mm, no. But it's just such a glorious noise. I mean, you know, if you're going to be noisy, you you got to pull out all the stops and do it shamelessly. And the 1812 Overture is one of the most shameless pieces of music ever. Just fabulous. It, of course, commemorates the defeat of Napoleon in the War of 1812. Oh, God, it's wonderful. I love it. I love it so much. Uh, next. Oh, this is a wonderful work that may not be as familiar with you as it should be. Vaughn Williams. The Overture to the Wasps. Now, this was written for, apparently, in Oxford back in those days. They would do a play by Aristophanes, or one of those people, in Greek. Because you had to know Greek. So they would do plays in Greek. I'll bet that was fun. And and uh, the Wasps was one of them. And Vaughan Williams wrote an overture, and he wrote incidental music. That is, music to accompany changes of scenery or certain scenes. And it's, oh, it's wonderful. The music is so beautiful. And what's fabulous about it is it's this, you know, ancient Greek play. The music is pure English nationalist countryside folk music. It's da 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 Beginner's type piece, and it's appropriate. It's Bernstein's Candide Overture. I mean, oh, it's wonderful. You've probably heard it. It's just, you know, it's six minutes of pure fun and pizzazz. It's delightful. It's one of his most popular pieces, one of the most popular concert overtures ever written. And the point, though, the thing that makes Candide so wonderful as an overture is that its model is Rossini, like, you know, as in the Barber of Seville, specifically the Rossini crescendo, because Rossini's overtures were famous for doing their thing. And at the end of the first group of themes, um, it would do a crescendo. It would take a little melodic idea and repeat it over and over and over again. In this case, like that. I mean, that's what Rossini Overtures did. And this was thrilling to audiences of the day and it's thrilling to audiences today. It's such an ingenious and simple and effective way to, to just bring the house down. And Bernstein, in his, does exactly that at the end of his overture. It goes with, with glitter and be gay, actually. You know, glitter and be gay. You know that tune from Candide? And the end of that is... Is it does the Rossini crescendo thing. So it's a wonderful way to end this chat about 10 fabulous, marvelous overtures um, for beginners of all ages, as they say in the business. Have a great time with these. I have a feeling you're going to. And, and I did listening to them just preparing this little chat. And I can't imagine a more enjoyable way to spend a few minutes than with one of these just, just delicious overtures. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.